Welcome back, everybody. Right. As promised, I have my good buddy, Justin Clement here. Justin is the COO of PestShare. So, Justin, uh, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Appreciate you having me. All right, man. So, um, I know most people at NARPM know what PestShare is, but for, the fo for those folks that are listening that really don't know what PestShare is just yet, can you give us a little bit of overview of what PestShare is and how does it help property managers? You bet. Yeah. Well, PestShare, uh, first and foremost, is a uh, SaaS company, ultimately. So we're kind of in, in the formulation of technology and we kind of ultimately believe that technology uh, can be used uh, to really improve the property managers, you know, various forms of operations. And so uh, one way is, one way that it does that ultimately is, is by establishing itself as a, an amenity for their residents uh, within any given PMC. And so uh, we essentially offer an amenity item uh, to give affordable access to pest control and uh, requesting various forms of pest control uh, professionally to those residents. So that way uh, the uh, property manager doesn't necessarily have to uh, take all of those pest control inquiries. Um, it kind of streamlines uh, part of their operation. And then as an added benefit, uh, it gives them an opportunity to collect on ancillary revenue by building in a margin within the other amenities that are within their uh, benefits package. So that's kind of ultimately how we how we operate. But it doesn't have to be in a benefits package, correct? Like I can have pest yeah. without a benefits package. And then the resident would basically correct. go online and just fill out and say, I need I need pest control. Is that basically how it works? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a, a proprietary software and this is kind of where the technology comes into play is that uh, every resident has access to that. So anytime that they need to request a professional pest control service, they utilize our software platform to go on identify the pest, uh, request that pest control, and then we essentially use our service network to execute that service. And so to to your point, they don't have to be, um, you know, we, we have many customers who use us as a standalone amenity within their, uh, you know, benefits uh, as an offering to their residents um, or as a simple line item within a number of other amenities that they include. And you guys partnered with Second Nature to be part of their resident benefit package. Is that correct? Yeah, that's actually a uh, a recent uh, uh, execution that we've just finalized. We just engaged in a channel partnership with uh, Second Nature. Um, I uh, it, that was just you know within the last I would say last thirty days that we we finalized that. So it's an exciting new uh, opportunity for both parties, and uh, we believe that uh, with both of our engagement. We're going to be able to provide uh, property management companies, residents, uh, their owners alike, in in the mutual benefit all across the board. So it's an exciting thing. That is. That's awesome. And uh, we're recording this. It's uh, early April. Uh, so you might be listening to a little bit later on. But so basically about, about February, March time frame, you guys solidified that deal. So you heard it here first, folks, but you actually may not have because we may not have heard this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, right, I so, don't, I don't know actually just, just yet if we've even released it, but, but by this time, the time that this airs, it'll definitely be the case. So that's, that's amazing. So uh, most people who know about Pest Share, they know that you guys, you're branded orange, that's your color. And like a couple of years ago, you st all of a sudden I started seeing all these people with orange, like uh, tennis shoes or orange uh, running shoes. Right. What the heck, like, what was that? What was behind that? Like, first of all, from a from a company perspective, I think it's genius. By the way, I think it's genius branding. You guys Thank always you. have tons of shoes at your booth now, and you, all your clients are wearing them. Mm -hmm. and it's amazing. How who came up with it? How did that come to fruition? What's the story behind the orange shoes? Yeah, well, uh, actually, that's a great, interesting story. Uh, just like many of our our you know much of our company vision, um, you know, both myself and and co founders Landon and Tom. You know the the beauty of our collaboration has has wielded a lot of unique things, and the orange shoe movement is one of those. And so, um, as such, we we really kind of believe in in um, you know creating positive change. And I think that is one of the one of the uh, most effective things that have come from the orange shoe uh, movement as well as creating that positive change, whether it be for the health of the property manager. 
um, or for simply just the recognition. I mean, granted, it's added benefit to uh, our brand recognition, but one of the the intents behind that is our ability to um, you know create that movement uh, within kind of just the the overall improvement within the 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 industry itself. So we we always want to be moving forward and never backwards. And so. I think with the uh, with the orange shoes in particular, um, obviously orange is our color, and you know we're we're uh, loud and proud about it. But at the same time, I think that uh, really it's about connecting everybody involved, and which is really a lot of what within the NARP of space, especially um, collaboration, um, connection, uh, being able to to really kind of come together and be united, especially I would say. Not to get you know political or anything, but really we have a lot of divisiveness in in the world today, and I think that this is kind of one thing that we really believe in is uh, just opportunity for all, inclusion and all, and um, and that's kind of one thing that uh, that we believe in is giving back to you know the community and and so Pest Share um, as an orange shoe movement uh, can utilize our orange shoes to create positive change in any form or fashion. So. Um, yeah. So did it happen by mistake though? Like, is it like one day somebody's wearing orange shoes? You're like, oh, that's cool. Or was it? You like know, what? obviously, teams like, hey, <laughs> I got this great idea. Orange yeah. shoes. Like, who's like? You know, what? <laughs> I, I'd love to take credit for that, but to be honest with you, Tom was the one that really, uh, really came. Uh, he came to one of our conferences. He's like, you know what? Uh, Second Nature's got their purple jackets. We need something. We need our identifier, and our identifier. Uh, for for him was those orange shoes, and we actually uh, he or so he ordered some orange shoes, uh, and uh, and he wore those to you know the first conference, and then it started to you know he got a lot of compliments on it, and uh, and I, I personally I'd have to admit I was pretty resistant to it at first, and I was like you know what I you know I just don't know about those things, and <laughs> yeah because I, I, I'm not super flashy, so I don't like you know I I don't want to stick out, but but you know what it's um. It was, it was something well, that very Now I noticeable. stick out because I wear regular shoes and everybody in the conference has orange shoes. <laughs> yeah. Like the only now you're the difference. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You well, know, and, and so like, that was kind of one of the things that we ended up, uh, you know, we, we caught on with it and, and really started to collaborate as to, you know, what we could put behind it as far as like message and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, other opportunities, uh, uh, whatnot for us as a company, as a community, whatever, but, uh, but that's really kind of where it started. It, it I would say that uh, it, in all things, happenstance kind of kind of went. Uh, it kind of came about by kind of, it just kind of it, and then it started to snowball. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, I think so. it's a brilliant marketing ploy, and I believe that um, you know now you have all these clients that are wearing it. They every Narpum conference, I see more and more orange shoes, and uh, it really kudos to you guys. You really got something great there. So let's pivot Thank off you. of orange shoes. And let's talk a little bit. So you have two other co-founders. So there's three of y'all. Mm -hmm. You're the uh, COO, Chief Operating Officer. When you guys are forming a company, how did you determine, you know, who sits in what seat? That's a great question. Um, uh, the Really, the, the way that we kind of do most things in general is really just natural and organic. And I think that kind of speaks to the way that we really operate in the function as a, a core leadership as well, um, you know, with with uh, all of us as co-founders. Um, and, and, and it really kind of extends to, you know, everyone, um, you know, in, in every company is everybody has naturally strong suits and and uh, and weaknesses. And, and we really try to embrace all of those, uh, you know, the good and the bad and the ugly. And uh, and that kind of is has been the magic to our uh, co-founding group is that we all really uh, cling to our strengths and we try to highlight those and we respect those and and we're really one of the big things that we that we believe is that there is really no room for ego um, yeah, especially in leadership and so um, we we as a as a core group ultimately a founding founding group we kind of take this as a collaborative opportunity where where though we we uh, essentially develop the vision together, we essentially execute in different fashions. And that execution is has to do with kind of where um, we decided that our, our kind of uh, core functions uh, as what we can provide as, as um, value to the company 
uh, kind of lie. Um, I would say, you know, one thing about myself, I tend to be, you know, very detail oriented. Um, I tend to enjoy, you know, connecting groups and and being able to, um, you know, kind of put all the pieces of the puzzle together. And that's kind of um, something that I naturally enjoy. Um, Tom is a, a natural salesman, has been all his life. And, um, and he actually, uh, you know, as, as a CRO, uh, he ultimately does it better than anybody else as, as opportunities and, uh, revenue generation new and old. Um, you know, he is extremely personable and, and the same thing with Landon. Landon is, is a networker by heart. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, he really, uh, kind of holds that. Uh, that as a or his CEO title as a uh, function of what he does best, and I think that that's kind of how we all uh, tend to approach this. So, you know, neither neither one of us um, really you know see very many uh, or very many differences amongst it. We really kind of see ourselves as one, and uh, and I think that's really been a key to a lot of our success, whether it be in in other ventures or this one especially. Did you go and you guys were sitting down, did you build an org chart or uh, for the whole company or did you build an org chart for what the company looked like at the time or, or kind of what the vision was? How'd that work out? Yeah. Um, so we actually uh, started out with uh, building that vision. What is that vision uh, ultimately that we, you know, that we started to run with uh, early on? Did you ever think it'd be a vision. SaaS company when you first started? You know, honestly, we, we, we didn't necessarily. Yeah, we did. thought uh, we we always we always envisioned the opportunity. Oh, sorry, my daughter's in here. <laughs> All right, we're gonna pause. We're gonna pause right here, yeah. guys. All right, back to that question. So, um, our vision or our early vision um, is not necessarily what it is today, and that vision continues to evolve, and you know, for the better. And that's kind of one of the exciting things about creating a vision and creating an org chart is that uh, vision tends to be uh, small and that org chart is even smaller uh, early stage and and it continues to grow and develop as time goes on and and we constantly go back to it and we constantly are are updating mm -hmm. and improving upon it and that's kind of one of the things that we we really enjoy seeing is the the growth and the potential that we see and we're always kind of looking one step ahead of of you know, what we think is possible, we're always trying to push, you know, one step beyond. So, so Tom, Tom is a visionary, you're an integrator, if you're into EOS, and I know a lot of people at NARPM are, <clears throat> when you were building the org chart versus Tom, Tom wanted to make it much bigger, you wanted to make it smaller? Is that, did that seem, does that sound about no, right? No, you know, I would say, honestly, we really, uh, all three of us really hold that, that, uh, you know, kind of that vision, I like they'd say that's really what, um, it was the beauty of our collaboration is is the fact that we we all in some fashion are visionaries and and again by by the EOS fashion um, I'd say though we all um, you know really kind of hold that vision or collaborate to that vision uh, uh, Landon I would say really kind of holds that visionary you know uh, title if you will as it, as it uh, stands with EOS and and we we kind of uh, we like I said we kind of like uh, you know, co-create that vision and we co-execute that vision um, as well. And so as we've developed it at the company, um, each of our strong suits have started to kind of continue to de develop and, and we start to execute that vision, um, you know, uh, on an evolutionary standpoint. And so we kind of really continue to tweak and, and, uh, and that, and that uh, changes, you know, day by day, month by month. And so, um, so if, if but yeah, wait. yeah, if somebody's listening to this, um, you know, what are some takeaways that you would tell them about like how often they should look at their vision to, you know, like, should they look at it yearly? Should they, should they, you know, um, should they think much bigger? Do they, is it, is there some value in thinking smaller and then seeing what that's, you know, like, so what, what would you, what would you tell somebody who's maybe just starting out, maybe have 50, 50 or 60 units that under management? about setting their vision is it important is it not like what, what would you what, what would you what would you counsel somebody on on that yeah i i guess my best um, counsel would be it is the most important um of anything the vision is is where you know everything stems from it's it's uh it's what 
it's what trickles down and trickles up. And it is uh, probably the most important aspect to any company is having a vision. Uh, because without a vision, it's it's very much kind of the same adage of, you know, uh, 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 a boat without sails, you know, has no destination. And uh, and that's kind of ultimately how, how we, you know, see that, that with any organization, you have to have a vision before you can execute anything. Um, so you so build a vision. I think... And from the vision, mm -hmm. you build your strategy and your plan. Absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, what, what we really like to do is we like to kind of work backwards from that. So we build our vision and we build it however grandiose it may seem. And then we start to to work backwards from that. And I'd say as far as the revision goes, um, we really believe in, in uh, uh, reviewing that on a quarterly basis um, at minimum. We and review the vision quarterly. Okay. Absolutely. Well, especially with, uh, and I would say one of the things too, that, um, you know, is somewhat relevant and, and dependent on your type of business is your scaling methods. Uh, because when you're, uh, scaling at a certain pace or a, your vision entails a certain scaling, uh, pace then, uh, or various growth trend, you need to, to, uh, continually, revise and review that vision more often and uh, that way you can course correct where necessary and early and often is kind of ultimately how we we really approach that because um, number one not only does it allow us to kind of maintain vision in the perspective especially when when you're growing at any significant pace ultimately um, you can very easily get caught into you know what may seem important and urgent, uh, but it really distracts you uh, in the day-to-day -day from that larger vision. So being able to kind of step back and forcibly re renew yourself to that vision allows you to gain that perspective again. And I think that's what's important in reviewing it early and often so that you can maintain, you know, if you are, your day-to-day -day has been taking you elsewhere um, that doesn't adhere to the vision, you can easily course correct. Do you adhere to the traction book as well as like, so you set your vision and then do you set your org chart for what, you know, the vision is whatever the company's finished. Do you build the org chart for that as well? And then kind of review that quarterly as well? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. We, we do the same, you know, again, kind of following that true EOS model and, and we've made our certain, you know, revisions off of that as well. And, and we've tailored it and I've, I believe kind of, you know, tailoring it to your organization, to your core values, it's also important um, because not every, every uh, you know, business is, uh, you know, as far as like the way you operate the business, uh, not every person is going to be the same. So, so it's really like what our belief ultimately is, is it's meant to be a, uh, a guiding principle and, uh, and for some starting out, it's an extremely uh, great way for you to be able to build that, uh, whether that be to the letter um, as described in EOS or whether you start to uh, to create your own functions outside of that and deviations. But uh, but that's kind of ultimately how we take that approach is we adapt it to, you know, how we see that vision continuing to grow. And so by by nature, we like to to adapt and innovate off of that. So. All right. I'm going to pivot here. So um, yeah. you were a division one college athlete. What'd you play again? Was it football? A long time ago. Yes. Yeah. I played uh, football. Actually, I was a strong safety at uh, Washington State University. Washington so. University. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Cougars? Yep. Yep. Yeah, the Cougars. Cougars. So go Cougs. <laughs> go Cougs. <laughs> we have a, we have a team down here in U, U, University of Houston, the Cougars and they could not make yes, it to the okay. floor. So, all right. So as a division one college athlete, what are some of the lessons you learned that, that you've taken and translated into your business life? Oh, I would say, um, you know, again, sports was a large part of my life growing up and, uh, and it still is honestly, even though I'm starting to become more old and broken than I would, uh, <laughs> than I, than I care to admit, but, um, uh, but it's uh, it's really kind of shaped the way that I approach uh, any situation, and I think that kind of comes into the core values that we that we hold uh, as a group as well as um, you know whether you played sports or you didn't. Um, you know, I'm grateful for the sports that taught me. Um, you know, so many of those core characteristics that I hold. You know, 
uh, one of those being grit, uh, that grit, that determination, the perseverance to to work past, um, you know, physical, mental pain. And and I would say, honestly, the one of the number one um, uh, lessons that I've learned is that um, it, it so much extends everything so much extends beyond the physical. Um, especially in the work and workplace it is much more mental um and i would say that the that sports is absolutely the same there is a very physical aspect to every sport however the mentality to be able to carry through to continually um check yourself to really introspectively look and see what am i doing right and what am i doing wrong um what do i do well what do i not do well both in a in an individual and a team sport um you know, so those those are very, very much characteristics that uh, that I've learned. And I, I will say that I appreciate probably more than even the physical, um, mm. you know, developments that that I've that I've been able to achieve uh, the mental aspect of it, the psychological, um, you know, lessons uh, or characteristics have been probably uh, more of the achievement that I appreciate today in business. And you said something, too, that makes a lot of sense. Um, business is a team sport. Right. Yeah. So you're used to team sports, right? You weren't a triathlete, you were a, a college uh, football player. And if somebody didn't do their job, you, they, you know, the team went lose, right? Like you have to do your job. Don't right. try to do too much, you know, stay in your lane type stuff. And uh, I think that's really important to know, like your team, um, if you're listening to this and you're a property manager and you're supervising people or you're a property management owner, a company owner, the team is really, really important. And so training, yeah, I, getting those A players I, becomes important. I agree, especially within that A team. That A team is critical in the cohesion. You know, you have to be a cohesive group and play as one. And and I would say that that very much is a principle that that aligns as a parallel with uh, business as well. Is that from the CEO all the way down to the janitor? Um, you know, it is it is no matter of importance. Um, it's just a matter of difference. And everybody hold, who holds any different type of role. Um, is much more lateral than they are vertical um, because the hierarchy that, uh, you know, is necessary, especially within an org chart, um, has to do with more role and responsibility, accountability versus it being importance. Every, I, we believe ultimately that every role um, is important. It's just different. And so, you know, none is, none is more important than the other um, because if you didn't have any particular role fulfilled, um, then the company would suffer and uh, and likewise, the other teammates would suffer. So you could have, you know, hot shot, you know, players on a team. But as we see also in sports, um, you know, a, a team that is that is comprised of the best of athletes who have the, the most dominant physical, uh, you know, characteristics don't always, uh, you know, win the national championship. They don't always take home the title uh, because really the team aspect of it and working together is uh, it will carry you the distance more than it will, more than the physical uh, talent. And I would say that that is very much true to the skill sets that people hold within various positions of the company. It's not necessarily about the the position or the skill set it's about the people who are willing to work together and really um you know integrate together and and collaborate as a team that even goes back to what's the vision what's this plan how do you get there what's the roadmap right your job as coo is to build that map now absolutely you've been coached your whole your whole life as an athlete where do you fall on the on the coaching you know for your business do you guys have a coach have you had a coach uh, do you believe in coaching? What's your what's your take? Uh, absolutely, I believe coaches are you know a fundamental fundamental part of your growth uh, as well. Because uh, you know where else are you going to you know have any sort of uh, reprimand? You know, or you know a lot of times we don't know what we don't know, and we can't see oftentimes what we can't may see, or may can't see through the weeds. Right, we're in the weeds. exactly the coach is a little bit yeah. higher up. Yeah. And I, and I will say that that's, that's oftentimes where we rely, especially a lot of our leadership as well. Um, you know, us as a, even as a co-founding group too, um, we, we, that's where we often believe that, that ego has no place. Uh, you know, we kind of work, operate on a standing rule that any, any time we enter a meeting, ego is left at the door and, and that's very necessary because it, it hurts to, to, you know, have your, 
shortcomings, uh, you know, easy out to there say, and, and criticize. Exactly. Exactly. Say, and so, so I'd say that a lot of the coaching, you know, that we have had also has come as an inner group, as a collective, um, but also um, we've leaned a lot on those who have been, uh, you know, our networks as well, those who have come before us. And we very much appreciate those other co-founding groups, those other entrepreneurs who have been there, done that. Um, and we, we appreciate their mentorship as well. Um, and so I'd say that, that if you are, find yourself in that group that um, rely and build that your network to, with those other people who have, have come before you to, to really learn and understand. Um, so maybe the mistakes that they made are mistakes that you don't have to make, uh, you know, in the end. Yeah, uh, at Empire, <clears throat> not only was Steve and I, the co-founders being coached, but uh, we actually started having our team coached. And so we'd have yeah. a coach for our team. And I think it's important that everybody in the organization gets some kind of mentorship, coaching, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, I'm a big believer in it. I figured you were uh, being uh, coached yeah. as a, as a <laughs> college athlete. All right, Justin, we are going to take a quick break and it will be right back for the the lightning round. We'll put you on a hot seat. We'll be right back. All right. All right. Welcome back, everybody. We have Justin Clement here, COO of Pest Share, the orange shoe gurus, and he is getting ready to be on the, in the lightning round. Are you ready, buddy? As ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> All right. What piece of, what is one piece of advice you would give someone just starting out in business? Oh man, you're starting off with that already, huh? Starting off oh, with the man, big there is, You know, honestly, I would say uh, approach anything and everything that you do starting out with humility. Um, because honestly, there's there's uh, those core characteristics and really embrace uh, what you do well and, and then find your complement for what you don't do well. And I think that that is one thing that I have uh, also learned to embrace is... Uh, is operating on compliments, not necessarily compliments. And uh, um, I, I've said that you know several times prior. But the your compliment, as opposed to operating on you know praise or compliments, uh, where it may or may not be necessary. And I think that that's kind of one of the one of the key uh, one of the one of the key characteristics that uh, I would say is humility and and uh, you know uh, really honing in on that passion. Uh, and I think that that will kind of carry you through um, all of the the ebbs and flows that any entrepreneur goes through when they they start out early on. I was gonna. I thought you were gonna go with grit. Come on, man. Just talked about it. No. Hey, just, you I'm know kidding, what? I'm kidding. It, 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 <laughs> it is very much. I mean, there are so many other aspects to yeah. it. But uh, but I'd say as as a core, honestly, like being able to really embrace that it, and really just persevere, that grit is absolutely necessary because, you know, grit's going to determine whether or not you're going to push through the low times, the hard times, the dip, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, so. Do you use virtual assistants? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Does pineapple belong on pizza? No. What was your first job? Um, my first job was uh, a wheat truck driver for a family friend. Wheat truck driver. Okay. Nice. Yeah. What is your ideal vacation? Relaxation on a beach somewhere in Kokomo, maybe Bermuda or Bahamas, you know. All right, I'm gonna take you for a hunting vacation. <laughs> All right, you went the other way. You know, hey, that's that's more work, and I love it for its own realm. But you know, give <laughs> me some peace and relaxation, and I'm there. What Disney character do you most associate with? Oh, that's a tough one. Disney character. I find it funny that this one stumps people the most. <laughs> that it is. It's hard because I, you know, and I should know too because we watch Disney movies all the time. I mean, we have a lot of young kids, so that should that should come a little bit easier. Um, you know what? Honestly, I would probably have to say uh, that I probably uh, relate to Aladdin, Aladdin. In, in many cases. 
Yeah. Your, your kids are always asking for, for uh, miracles and you uh, make them happen. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> not the genie, but Aladdin. <laughs> no, Aladdin, so not the genie. Got it. All right. Uh, so it just shows you, I don't have any young kids. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> what is, what is something that most people do not know about you? Can't say football player anymore in division one. Cause I just told everybody that one. So, uh, um, I would probably have to say, uh, that I was born in Germany. Um, okay. Yeah. And, uh, that I was run over by a car when I was three years old and really? squeaked through. So yeah. Speck and Sie Deutsch. I don't know. Yeah, I was, yeah, my dad That's was all I know. Military, so. <laughs> yeah. What is one challenge you're facing currently in your business? Um, I would say one challenge that we face currently um, is connecting uh, all of our uh, processes across departments. I would say that's kind of one of the, one of the, uh, core things that we've been working on lately, especially at the growth scale that we've been, uh, you know, moving and approaching. Um, it's so important for us to continue to connect every part of the departments. And, uh, and that's kind of one of the challenges right now that we're working through. What do you prefer, prefer dogs or cats? Dogs. Okay. Justin, if somebody wanted to learn more about pet share or wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way to get, to get you? Um, pestshare.com uh, slash property managers. That is uh, the best way. Um, or they can snag us at our booth at uh, any NARPM conference. Uh, we're always there. Um, you'll see us in the orange shoes, if, if anything else. So we're, we're quite noticeable. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening to this and you're not a NARPM member and you'd like to join, um, please go to NARPM, N-A-R-P-M dot O-R-G or call them at 800-782-3452. And if you want to be like Justin and have virtual assistants that work for your company, please think about VPM Solutions. Go to VPM, Virtual Property Management Solutions.com, or you can reach out to me, Pete, at VPMSolutions.com. Justin, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate you, man. Thanks, Pete. Always a pleasure.